Hello class. In this video, we will be covering 1.1, graphs of equations. Now in this section, we're only going to be covering specifically circles, okay? So we will talk about some general information, but ultimately we want to start talking about circles, okay? So in this particular section, we're gonna start off with um, the graph of an equation concept. So you have used a coordinate system to graphically represent the relationship between two quantities. There, the graphical picture consisted of a collection of points in a coordinate plane, which we now know how to plot points in a coordinate plane according to P.6. It says a frequent relationship between two quantities is expressed as an equation in two variables, okay? So this happens many, many times. Um, for instance, y equals seven minus three x is an equation in x and y. And an ordered pair, a, b, is a solution or a solution point to this equation when you substitute x equal to a and y equal to b, and it results in a true statement, okay? So for example, um, two, one. If I wanna know if two, one is a solution or not, I would plug in two for x, and one for y and see if I get a true statement. There's some math I need to compute on this right-hand side, but I do get a true statement, which means that this is a solution to the equation. Okay, versus if you have another point, say, um, one comma three. If I have something like this, I plug in one for X and three for Y, I get three equals seven minus three times one. So three equals seven minus three, three equals four, and that is not true. We say false. And when you get a false statement, you would tell me that this point is not a solution. Okay, so let's see. So if I wanted to graph an equation, okay, if I wanted to graph an equation, essentially what you would do is you would isolate one of these variables. And since y in this equation, y is already by itself, I already have a variable isolated. Then the one that's inside an algebraic exp expression is the one you're going to randomly pick values. Now, normally we pick these, excuse me, I have a hiccup now. <laughs> um, normally we have these three values, but sometimes we need more information in order to get a good visual of what the graph would look like. And so I guess in this case, they chose to plug in a few more um, than just the, usually I use negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. Cause that gives me like a good idea of what's happening on the left of zero and what's happening on the right of zero. And then if I need to keep knowing what's going on further to the right, I'll plug in more positives. If I need to know what's going on to the left, I'll plug in more negative x values, okay? So um, how are they getting these values? So they're plugging in negative one for x. Now you can use your um, programming capability of your calculator. So if I do hit the first value, negative one store as x, okay? And you hit enter. Now, every time I type in X, it's going to automatically plug in a negative one. So I want to plug in X into here. So negative three X plus seven. And when I hit enter, it's going to plug in the negative one and we get 10. Now, if I do zero stores X, okay? And I go and highlight that uh, expression again. If I hit enter, it plugs in zero and I get seven, okay? 
Now for an expression real small like this, it may not be necessary to use the programming um, capability of the calculator. However, as our functions or our equations that we try to graph, as they get more complicated, this process will come in handy. And so it may be best to practice it with smaller functions or smaller equations where you could do it on in your head or on your own, just so that you get practice with um, using the calculator this way. So the other one is if I plug in one into that expression, I get the four. If I plug in two into the expression, I get the one. If I plug three into the expression, And hit enter, I get this negative two. And finally, if I store four and I plug it into the expression, I get this negative five, okay? And so then each of these are y, y equals this, 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 and y equals this. And these were all the x values that I plugged in. So my coordinates to my point are going to be the x value comma the y value. x comma y, 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 okay? And then if we plot all of those points, let's see what that looks like. So if we plot the point negative 1, 10, that's up here. If we plot the point zero seven, that's here. If we plot the point one four, that's here. Two one is here. Um, three and negative two is here. And then four and negative five is here. And then you just draw a line connecting all of those dots and you have created the graph of the equation y equals negative three x plus seven. Now we're going to talk about a concept called intercepts, okay? So it is often easy to determine the solution points that have zero as either their x-coordinate or their y-coordinate. So things that would look like this or things that would look like this. This point has a zero as the x-coordinate and this has a zero as the y coordinate, okay? Points that are of that type, where they have a zero as one of the coordinates um, are called intercepts, okay? Um, because they intersect the x axis or the y axis. So here are some graphs or images of um, points with intercepts. There we go. I wasn't focusing earlier, but I think it's good now. So it is possible for a graph to have no intercepts. They could have one intercept, two intercepts, or several intercepts, okay? For instance, this graph has no x-intercepts because it does not touch the x-axis, but it has one y-intercept because it touches the y-axis one time, okay? Whereas this graph has three places that it touches the x-axis. So it has three x-intercepts. However, it only touches the y-axis once right there at the origin. This graph over here only touches the x-axis once. So it has one x-intercept and it touches the y-axis twice. So it has two y-intercepts. And then this graph, which is a circle in this second quadrant, does not touch the x-axis or the y-axis, so therefore it has no intercepts, okay? Now, an x-intercept can be written like this, where you have the x value at which it touches the x-axis, but the y-coordinate is zero when you touch the x-axis, okay? And then the y-intercept can be written as an ordered pair, where you have zero for x, but you have a y coordinate. So it'll tell you where it touches the y axis. So 
So some texts denote the x-intercept as the x-coordinate of a point and the y-intercept as the y-coordinate of the point rather than the point itself, okay? Unless it is necessary to make a distinction, the term intercept will refer to either the point or the coordinate, okay? So essentially what that means is that you have to pay attention to the directions inside the web assignment, okay? Because if I have a point here, and let's say the coordinates of this point were um, two comma zero, this is an x-intercept, but depending on the direction, sometimes they want the x-intercept as a point. So it would be two comma zero. And sometimes they like the x-intercept as a value, which would just be the x-coordinate of that intercept. Okay, so it really just depends. You need to pay attention to the question and figure out whether or not they want a point or they want just a value. Now, identifying X and Y intercepts, so basically finding X and Y intercepts, how do we do that? So here you have a graph um, of Y equals X cubed plus one shown below. Um, and if you look at that, you can see that it does have a y-intercept at positive one, and it does have an x-intercept at negative one, okay? Um, but how would we be able to determine that would be basically you're plugging in charts and you're finding these, okay? So you're plugging in zero for x and finding the y-intercept, and then you're plugging zero for y and finding the x-intercept. Okay, and in this particular function if or equation, if I plug in zero for X, you get that Y equals zero plus one or Y equals one. Then if you plug in zero for Y, you get this equation. And if I solve this for X, you get that negative one equals X. And so then you have the X intercept of negative one comma zero, okay? So you can find them just by plugging in the corresponding zeros, okay? So if you wanna find the X intercept, you need to find that X value. So you're gonna set Y equal to zero. And if you're trying to find the Y intercept, you need to find that Y value. So you're setting the X equal to zero, okay? Now, some other interesting things about graphs is that some graphs do have what's called symmetry, okay? So essentially, if you were to fold the graph in half, it looks the same, okay? Um, and some of them have symmetry. There's different kinds of symmetry, and some of them don't have symmetry at all, okay? So we definitely need to discuss the different kinds of symmetry and then how you would know whether or not um, an equation is going to have that kind of symmetry, okay? So, um, so graphs of equations can have symmetry with respect to one of the coordinate axes, or it could even have symmetry with respect to the origin. Now, Symmetry with respect to the X axis means that when the Cartesian plane were folded along the X axis, the portion of the graph above the X axis would fold over and coincide with the portion below the X axis. They basically look like mirrors when you unfold it, okay? Your fold or your crease on the X axis becomes that mirror. And so you can see like this image is a mirror image of this one if the X axis were in fact a um, fold, okay? Similarly, um, symmetry with respect to the Y axis is if you were to create, here's a graph, and if you were to fold the paper on the Y axis, the left side and the right side would mirror each other with the Y axis acting like the mirror. 
Okay. The one that's a little more difficult to wrap your mind around is the symmetry with respect to the origin. Essentially what's happening is that you're folding it over the X axis and then you're folding it over the Y axis or vice versa. You're folding it over the Y axis first and then folding it over the X axis, okay? Regardless of the order of your folds for the origin, if you do both folds on the X axis and the Y axis, then you do have that symmetry with respect to the origin. So essentially what's happening is if I fold it over the X axis, this part would mirror down here, okay? But then if I fold over the Y axis, this part would mirror over here, okay? And that's symmetry with respect to the origin. Versus if I were to fold it over the Y axis first, then this part would fold this way. And then if I were to fold over the X axis, this green image would fold right onto this bottom part, okay? So essentially that's what you're doing for the origin is you're doing both symmetries, the X and the Y at the same time, okay? So of course, naturally there's going to be um, some tests for symmetry. So it says, if you want to test for symmetry um, with respect to the X axis, okay, then essentially what you're gonna do is you're going to replace, um, or I'm sorry, I'm not saying this right. A graph is symmetric with respect to the X axis when you have a point on the graph, but when you change the sign of the Y coordinate, this new point is also on the graph. Okay, um, and that was shown here. So you've got this point here. Notice that the X value is the same, but the Y value, it's the same distance away from the X axis, but this one's in the positive direction and this one's in the negative direction, okay? So they'll share the same point, but the Y values will be negative. Now, similarly, a graph is symmetric with respect to the y axis whenever there's a point on the graph and then the same point with the opposite x coordinate is also on the graph. So in this image right here, right, these points have the same y value, but this x value, although it's the same distance, it's in the positive dire x direction or the negative x direction, okay? But both of these points are on that graph. And then similarly with symmetry, symmetry with respect to the origin, that occurs when you have a point on the graph and then the opposite of both coordinates is also on the graph, okay? And so that's essentially what happened here without my green, okay? So if you do have a point here, then there also exists one with opposite signs on both coordinates, okay? Now, Here is a graph so we can talk about some more symmetry. It says, you can conclude that the graph of y equal to x squared minus two is symmetric with respect to the y axis because the point negative x, y is also on the graph of y equals x squared minus two. So what they've done is they've plugged in a bunch of negative numbers, three of them, they plugged in x equal to negative three, negative two, and negative one. And then they also plugged in their counterparts, positive one, positive two, positive three. Now, when they did that, um, they noticed that they got all of these y coordinates. And if you realize, these have the same y coordinate, but different x's. And that was exactly the definition of symmetry with respect to the y axes. And if you look at all of the points plotted and this whole graph plotted, you'll notice that if I were to fold the paper along the y-axis, this image is a mirror of itself. So how do we find algebraically whether or not an equation is symmetric with respect to the x-axis, y-axis, or the origin, 
okay? That is done by um, this test for symmetry. So if you replace your y with a negative y and you end up with an equivalent equation, then you have symmetry with respect to the x-axis. Similarly, if you replace x with negative x and you end up with the same equation, that is symmetry with respect to the y-axis. And then if you replace both x with negative x and y with negative y and you result the same equation, then they're going to have symmetry with respect to the origin, okay? So give me one second, I'm gonna pause and I'll be right back. I just wanna see if we do any tests for symmetry in this 1.1 section before I keep going. Because I don't have any examples of this and I don't know if those examples are necessary. So give me one second. It'll literally seem like a second to you, but for me, I'm taking a minute. Okay, there's no problems that have you do the test for uh, uh, symmetry. There is a problem that asks you about the symmetry visually, okay? So you'll be able to answer that question just by looking at the graph, whether or not it has symmetry. It folds over the x-axis. Actually, folding over the x-axis would be this way. And then, it, or if it folds over the y-axis, or if you fold it over the y and then the x, or the x and then the y, okay? Um, but if I continue, we finally get to the S section about circles. So we're almost through with this um, section here. So if I talk about circles, circles have a basic um, equation, okay? Um, and so essentially what they're gonna do is they said consider the circle shown in this figure and there's a point on the circle x, y and the distance from the center and another point called h, k where h, k would be considered the center of the circle that distance between the two is the radius of the circle. So here you have the center, and then you have another point that's on the circle. It could be anywhere on the circle, but the distance between these two points is a value uh, called the radius, okay? And so how do you find the distance between these two points, right? You subtract the x values, so x minus h, you subtract the y values, y minus k, you square both items, and then you take the square root, and that distance should be equal to the radius, okay? But if I square both sides of this equation, you end up with what's called the standard form of the equation of a circle. And that standard form looks like this. So notice there's no more square root, but now there's a square over here on the radius, okay? And if you do have an equation that's in this form, it's really nice for it to be in this form because then you can tell me what the H and the K are, which is the center, okay? So for example, if you had an equation that looked like this, remember this is basically the same thing as saying this, which is telling me that H is equal to zero and K is equal to zero, which is telling me that the center is at h comma k. So the center is at the origin, okay? Um, so let's keep going with that notion. Now for this problem, it says, the point three, four lies on a circle whose center is at negative one, two, and shown in this figure below. So here you have a point on the circle three, four, and here you have another point, which is the center of the circle, negative one, two. And what they're asking us to do is write the standard form of the equation of this circle. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to write the standard form. It's X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared equal to R squared. And so I do know what the center is. So I do know what H and K are. So I can plug those in. I have X minus H, which is a negative one. And then I have Y minus K, which is a two. I don't know what R squared is. So in this parentheses, I get X plus one squared. 
and then I get y minus two squared. I'm still stuck because I don't have the radius, okay? However, I do know that the radius by definition is the distance between the center and another point on the circle. So as long as I can find this distance, I'll know what that radius is. So we're gonna go ahead and calculate that distance and we're gonna take the square root of, I'm gonna take this X coordinate minus this X coordinate squared plus the Y coordinate two minus the Y coordinate four squared. And I get negative four squared plus negative two squared which is 16 plus four, which is the square root of 20. So that tells me that this distance here is the square root of 20 units, okay? Which means my radius is square root of 20. But because I have that square there, it will cancel out the square root. And so my equation in standard form looks like just parentheses x plus one squared plus parentheses y minus two squared equal to just 20, okay? And this is the standard form of the equation. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the practice problems, okay? So the practice problems in this section is just two of them. One of them says, write the standard form of the equation with the circle with this as the center and radius of square root of 19. So if this is the center, then we already know what H and K are. And if this is the radius, then I already know what R is. Those are the only three pieces of information I need in order to fill in the equation of a circle. So if that's the standard equation, I'm gonna say X minus negative four, Y minus three, and square root of 19 squared. So here I get X plus four in the parentheses, Y minus three in this parentheses, and then the square root and the square cancel, and I just have 19. So it's much, faster and easier when you're already given the radius versus that other example where I had to go find the radius using the distance formula, okay? Now, example, practice two is a little different. This one we might have to think about a little bit, okay? So this one says, to write the standard form of the equation of a circle with end points of diameter at four, three, and negative eight, seven. So what that means is that I have this graph here and I have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and here's a point. Then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And these guys meet here. They're telling me that this is the diameter of the circle, which means it goes right across the circle. So to me, that means that my circle is like this. Now, I don't have a lot of space there, so I'm trying my best to draw a circle, but you get the idea, okay? So there's the circle, and these two points create the diameter, okay? Now remember, in order for me to write the equation, I need to know the center and the radius, okay? And right now I do not have the center or the radius, okay? Most importantly, I don't have the center, okay? That's what's super important here is the center. Well, I know that if I do have a line segment and I wanna find the guy in the middle, that by definition is the midpoint. So I know that the center is gonna equal the midpoint. And we know how to calculate the midpoint you add the x values together and divide by two. You add the y values together and you divide by two. So I end up with negative four over two comma negative four over two, which is negative two, negative two, which according to my graph, that's about where this point is. It's at negative two, negative two. 
Now I didn't use graph paper, so it might not look like it's exactly at negative two, negative two, but it is in fact at negative two, negative two, according to the algebra, okay? So I do know the center now, which means I know that my H is negative two and my K is negative two. But now I still need to know the radius, okay? And the radius is the distance between the center and a point. So the radius can be found by taking the distance here between these two, the center and this point, or you can find the radius by taking the distance between the center and this other point. I'm just gonna choose this one and the coordinates of that one are four, three, right? So let's go find the distance between the point four, three and the center negative two, two. So that distance is going to be, I subtract the X values. So four take away negative two squared, then subtract the Y values, three take away negative two squared. And so I get four plus two, which is six squared. And then three plus two, which is five squared. So I get 36 plus 25, which is, um, 50, 61. So I get the square root of 61. And since that's the distance between here and here, that is my radius. So now I know my H and K for my center, and I know that my radius is the square root of 61. I can finally give them the equation. So the equation will be X minus the H value squared plus Y minus the K value squared equal to the square root of 61 squared. So here this turns into x plus 2 squared, and this turns into y plus 2 squared, and then the square root and the square cancel, and I just have 61. And this is the standard form of the circle equation. Okay, We just had a lot that we had to calculate. We had to find the radius and the center when they give us the two endpoints of diameter, okay? But that should be enough information um, to be able to go on and complete the 1.1 um, homework assignment. And as always, if you get stuck on the homework or see a problem that doesn't um, quite look familiar, you definitely can ask me or text me about it and I can help you with those, okay? But other than that, you guys have a great day.